Edison. She's going to be leading the discussion uh, with this handpicked group of expert panelists. I will let her uh, introduce them and hopefully lead us into an amazing discussion this afternoon. Right, I'll leave you to it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining uh, this panel. As uh, was mentioned, we'll be talking about the future of precision diagnostics in emergency medicine. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, as a researcher and a clinical operations specialist, a lot of us spend my time thinking about our areas where our systems break down, where we don't do what we say we're looking to do clinically, and finding ways to do it better. Um, and really precision being the ultimate goal. And so in some circles, we talk about precision statistically um, in a way that's not quite what we're looking to achieve. We're actually talking more a little bit more about accuracy, getting the right care for each patient when they need it and really focusing on both process and diseases. So it's my pleasure to be able to have this panel uh, to join this discussion. We have some experts here who've been tackling this from a dualistic perspective and some other insights as well. One is really looking at the front lines for when things need to happen on an emergency care basis. The other is actually looking at the technology side and seeing what's available, what could be available to really merge and bridge what we're looking to do in emergency medicine with what is possible. And so with that, what I'll do is I'll give everyone just a brief one-liner and each one of our panelists and then we'll go around and let them tell you a little bit more about what they do and uh, personally are interested in, as well as what they work on with their teams. And so first I'll start with Bob Jr. Uh, Bobby is the CEO and founder of Prognosis. Uh, Prognosis is a company that is exploring machine learning and biomarkers to make more precise diagnoses of infectious disease. So thank you for joining us, Bobby. Uh, we also have Dr. Tim Sweeney, who is the co-founder and CEO of Inflamatics. Inflamatics is a company developing tests for accurate bacterial infections, viral infections, and sepsis um, based on biomarkers that are actually currently patented or being evaluated at different stages of development. Um, so thank you for joining, Tim. Uh, we have Jar Dr. Jeremiah Henson, who's the director of research in the Johns Hopkins Department of Emergency Medicine. So East Coast counterpart to our West Coast operation here at Stanford uh, in emergency medicine. And Dr. Henson's research is on increasing the utility of pre-existing electronic health record data to improve decision-making of which diagnosis is one aspect, but also using machine learning, artificial intelligence, and improving the presentation of information so that it can actually be used more effectively. So thanks for joining as well, Jeremiah. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Um, Diku Mandavia, uh, who is the CMO of BrainScope, uh, also emergency medicine faculty at UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. BrainScope is a non-invasive medical device that objectively assesses head injury patients for both brain bleeds and concussions at the point of care. And so with that, I'll let our panelists tell you a little bit more about what they do. Uh, looks like we have more people joining us as well. And we will start with Bobby. Tell us a little bit more about you. Thanks so much, Maya. And thank You're you welcome. to the organizers for the opportunity um, to speak to this uh, panel. Uh, so I'll tell you just a little bit about Prognosis. Um, so we're based in Chicago. What we basically do, we like to say, is we build maps and GPS systems to better understand and profile patients uh, amongst kind of the vast heterogeneity of disease. Um, the, I think this panel is really relevant to what we do just because we feel that in hospitals and in emergency departments today, we still kind of overall use one size fits all protocols and approaches to treat many of the patients that come into EDs and the hospitals. So our goal is really to change that and to you know, enable precision medicine in emergency departments and hospitals by building these maps in the GPS systems. So we think you know, similar to what has really made a difference in cancer, um, we need to do the same thing in the hospital and the ED. So what we do is we, uh, we grow a proprietary data set that combines a, a lot of different biomarkers with clinical data from the EHR to better map out the heterogeneity of disease. And then we build the systems that in real time can gather the data needed to place a patient on those maps and to suggest the optimal treatment for the patient. Um, so yeah, so we've uh, been growing that data set in collaboration with uh, eight different hospitals um, and we're really excited to uh, usher in this next generation of precision medicine. That's fantastic. Thank you, Bobby. And maybe next I'll hand over to, uh, we could move over to Tim. Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, just personally, my background, I was in clinical medicine. Actually, I trained at Stanford uh, in general surgery for uh, four years before ending up as a postdoc in um, biomedical informatics and machine learning uh, with my now co-founder, Pravesh Khatri, who's still a professor in computational technology there. 
And the original idea was to better diagnose post-op infections using um, circulating mRNAs from the blood, really sort of patterns of expression within white blood cells. But over the years, that turned into uh, a desire for a test that could more quickly give a physician um, diagnostic and prognostic information when a patient is just presenting with um, signs and symptoms of acute inflammation. Uh, so Inflamatics uh, next year will launch uh, the Triverity test, which will be the first one of our pipeline. It's one of these cartridge-based tests. Basically, you can click a blood tube right in here. We have onboard reagents for RNA extraction. Then there's a sort of an array of, of wells. Um, and we measure a bunch of mRNAs quantitatively in about 30 minutes. And that first test basically will say, hey, you know, whether or not um, a patient in front of you has a bacterial infection, whether or not they have a viral infection, by the way, that could be um, both negative, meaning, you know, non-infectious, look somewhere else. Uh, we can also predict the need for um, uh, seven-day uh, ICU interventions. Uh, and that's the first of a, of a pipeline of many tests that all look at gene signatures as a way of generally informing on, you know, better diagnostic, prognostic, or therapy response uh, prediction uh, across a range of uh, really acute and critical indications. So looking forward to the panel today. Uh, I think it's a great time to be innovating uh, in, in emergency medicine. Fantastic. Um, Jeremiah. Sure. Uh, thanks. So um, I have kind of a mixed background as well. So I, I first trained uh, University of North Carolina, did a PhD in molecular pathology. Uh, and then I went to medical school in the Bronx at Einstein, came and did an EM residency, uh, which was not expected. But I just really liked the field. So uh, I did an EM residency at Hopkins where I stayed uh, and, and I backed into data science here. So um, inside the department, uh, I am I work with uh, as the assistant director of research, um, done a lot of work in uh, sepsis doing clinical trials and diagnostics evaluation. We're building a um, embedded diagnostics incubator within our emergency department right now that will go live in a, in a month or two. I'm also the co-director and co-founder of a center for data science in EM here, and we have uh, multiple R awards to develop and study artificial intelligence-driven decision support, uh, and predictive models uh, to improve diagnosis um, and risk stratification of patients in general. Uh, and then finally, um, I work as a chief medical officer for a Hopkins spin-out company called Stochastic. So uh, the way that works, it was an NSF-funded uh, company initially, now private. Um, and uh, when we develop a technology that is useful, um, through research, it then spins out into uh, the, the company so that we can disseminate it across the country. And so we have uh, a few tools that are commercialized now as well. Um, but we're uh, inside Hopkins always collaborating with industry as well um, to evaluate uh, tools that have been developed, so. Yeah, that's a, a great jumping off point. Um, and then also Deku, if you'll go next. Well, thank you, Maya. It's an honor to be here. So my background is emergency medicine as well. I trained at USC and I'm still part-time faculty there, but I've been a med tech executive for the last 15 years and I've been involved with disruptive medical technologies. And it's interesting to hear they had a, a lively discussion around point of care ultrasound. I spent a lot of my career around that. I was the chief medical officer for Sonocyte and then subsequently for Fujifilm. So I know what it takes to, to get a disruptive technology in active use. And most recently, I'm with a very exciting company called BrainScope. You may not have heard about BrainScope, but BrainScope has really developed a breakthrough device. They spent about a decade building a point of care device where we can now, as emergency physicians, evaluate the head injured patient and reliably exclude an intracranial hemorrhage, as well, furthermore, really get an idea of their level of concussion. And that's really a game changer. So if you talk about precision medicine, you talk about emergency medicine getting more sophisticated in management of minor head injury. Um, I think that's a real game changer. You know, in emergency medicine, the the care pathway for head injury hasn't changed for decades. We've had a blunt instrument called a CT scan, and that it's it's that was the only pathway. It's a CT or no CT. So the fact that we have a point of cure device that gives you an answer right at the bedside uh, doesn't you don't need a radiologist a neurologist you as an emergency patient are empowered um, again that would not be possible without a full decade of research which was largely funded by the department of defense well over 30 million dollars of, of r d effort uh, from them 
we have over 30 papers and nearly 90 patents. So this device uh, is uh, now just getting commercialized and I think about to change the, the way we practice medicine around head injury. That's fantastic. And I think one of the one of the themes that's coming out from the approaches that everybody here seems to be taking is really understanding the clinical problem and then developing the tech to address that. Um, and that was something that came up in one of our earlier panels is that, you know, often AI um, and innovation is almost a hammer looking for a nail, whereas, um, you know, oftentimes starting with the nail is where you actually get the biggest bang for your buck. And so if, if you all wouldn't mind commenting on your approaches to doing just that, um, it would sort of fill out the discussion we've been having throughout the day. I, I guess I'll start. I mean, you know, as uh, as practicing clinicians, it's a, about solving a problem. Uh, we see a lot of technologies. In fact, in my experience as a med tech executive, I've seen a lot of different companies and technologies where it's interesting, but don't really solve a really important problem. And I think that's where um, companies need to be grounded. Uh, they, that's why actually I think having physicians as part of their advisory group or uh, even as part of their executive team really helps uh, in their direction and really helps them become successful because the end game is actually helping patients, right? And you can't help patients if you don't know the problems to solve. And so I actually very excited that Stanford's hosting a conference like this. I think emergency medicine is now at the level of sophistication that we should be playing an active role with med tech companies in solving the problems. And we're the ones that best know those problems. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I don't think it will surprise anyone to, to hear the, you know, the idea of having physicians involved early is, is great. Uh, maybe a counter example is, um, it, you know, in sepsis detection, what I what I learned having moved over from being a physician for a long time is, you know, tens, dozens, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on more rapid ways to detect uh, bacteremia, right? And that's you know maybe a worthwhile goal, but it's always sold to investors as you know we're ninety nine percent accurate versus blood culture, and this thing is going to revolutionize medicine, and there's the sort of missing piece of like well, blood cultures aren't great tests, right? And you. So you, you know, you may know that if you practiced, um, but that missing piece of the experience, you know, the clinician's experience, like, what do you want? I mean, you know, do you need to know about bacteremia in particular, or do you want to know, you know, what treatment are you choosing for this patient? Do they need antibiotics? Is it something else? Um, so that, you know, there was probably 15, 20 years of, of sort of a, a lack of connection between um, what do physicians actually need in order to move forward with this patient right now versus what can the industry supply uh, from a push side. And so I think the more um, we focus on on how, you know, how can we make a test actionable? What decision will be made downstream of this? And is that something that's really going to impact patient outcomes if we make it uh, in a better manner? That I think is, is how we've tended to find our most successful ideas and movement in the pipeline. Yeah, I think that's a that's the key is decision, the word decision and, and, and then like what the action will be that follows. There are a lot of things that are uh, like comparing to blood cultures. I, as an emergency physician, I, I don't actually care what the blood culture result is because I'll never see it. Right. Um, so what is the decision that I make on the blood culture, like whether to order it or not? Uh, so if something, you know, it, it, it is compared to that and that that's kind of the decision I'm replacing, it's not replacing anything. So I, I think you, we see a lot of things uh, come out that um, they solve a. When, when working with industry, we often see that people are solving the wrong problem. There's not a good understanding of what our problem in the emergency department is. Um, it, it's a, a technology that's developed by someone downstream based on their perception of what our our problem is. And we've we've done a lot of these. Uh, kind of activities where we will bring someone in from industry, multiple large companies, and just do fact-finding missions. And you put a, a, a pharma pharmacist a, and a, an ID physician, an intensive care physician, and an emergency physician in a, in a room and talk about a problem, and everyone understands the problem differently. Uh, and and they're, it, when you have the wrong person uh, kind of trying to develop a solution, it becomes problematic. So I think when you're developing things for the emergency department specifically, having the right right people in the room who understand the decision making in that environment is critical. I think the other thing is about information. So so often there's a decision and there's an action that follows. And 
it, the question or the, the assumption is often that we don't have the information that we need. Uh, but oftentimes it's not that we don't have the information, it's that we don't have the cognitive bandwidth to interpret the information and act on it, make the right decisions. Um, so I think that's actually a, a big factor is understanding whether the information that you're trying to create already exists in some form uh, and it just is not being used. Uh, and how do you get someone to use that information or be able to interpret it in real time? So you yeah, know one, I think, go right ahead, Bobby, sorry. Yeah, I'll just uh, chime in briefly. Um, I think it's a great topic. I think it's a classic um, mistake that engineers and scientists make all the time, right, is um, use a tool and search for, for a problem. Um, just one thing to add to what these guys said. Um, I think when it comes to AI and ML in particular, I think everybody knows that these algorithms and these techniques are only as good as the data that you input into them. Uh, the techniques themselves are actually quite stupid but it's really just about the data, right? It's about the data that you use to train these algorithms. And I think that um, when it comes to, to problem-based uh, development, we really think it's about generating or getting the right data to solve a problem. And I think in the field, uh, a lot of people either do one of two things. They either just use existing data that's out there and just kind of hope that it's gonna be the right data to solve the problem that they're looking for, or they're very tool focused and they have a tool that they want to commercialize and they only get the data from that tool. So I think instead of that, uh, you know, a more holistic approach of saying, this is the problem I want to solve. These are all the different data elements that we would need to solve that problem. And then if many of these data elements don't exist, it, you know, you can't just hide your head in the sand and just say, uh, you know, I'm not going to use those data elements. You need to go out and get the data. So, so I think being more holistic and making sure that the data sets that you're building these algorithms and everything on match the problem you're trying to solve is, is really critical. And so, Bobby and Tim, I know this is work that you have embarked on, and I believe the rest, the whole group as well. But when the current environment doesn't have the data you're looking for, so step one is see what data is available to you and what you can ascertain with that. But then when you identify that you need additional data, how do you cross that bridge? And do you cross that bridge at all times? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can, I can start. Um, I think that for us, what we did is we looked at all of the literature that was available for example, starting in sepsis, and we said that, okay, you know, there's all these parameters that have already been very well studied, right? Things ranging from, you know, just as simple as age, as demographic information, to as complex as, you know, more detailed uh, blood-based biomarkers. And there was a lot of literature out in the field, and we said, well, all of this is, is very well studied, and a lot of it can be pretty well understood in terms of representing, uh, representing different biological pathways. And so when we were creating our data set, we tried to make sure that we were covering all the different dimensions of better understanding disease. One example I like to use is that um, if you're trying to model a three-dimensional object, then if you only if you only have X and Y data and you have no Z data, no matter how much X and Y data you get, you're never going to be able to really model that three-dimensional object. So we tried to use our best understanding of biology to cover all the different dimensions that would be important to model um, these different conditions. And then we went out and decided to get that data if, it, if, if we didn't have it. Um, yeah, I think my, my two cents would be, so, so, um, our, our platform looks at mRNA signatures. And so, um, you know, it's not something that sits in the medical record. It's not something for which there's millions of things, you know, millions of, of data points available. Uh, what we had to do was start small and say, you know, here's, here's a feasibility signature. Uh, we'd like to work with some folks, test in your databases and, um, generate some new data sets. And, and then that was successful. And then sort of we could incorporate that test data back into training. And then we had a better signature and, and a little bit, you know, more uh, resources to do some more prospective validations and we could test it and put it back into training. That's uh, an iterative process that's, that's taken a long time. Our, it'll actually be our fourth generation signature that goes through FDA. Um, but, you know, its performance has improved a lot over time. And the other thing that does, it leaves a nice long trail uh, uh, literature showing that, um, you know, a given test works not just in one population one time or according to a certain inclusion criteria, but, you know, broadly in different conditions and different hospitals and different patient types. Uh, and I think ultimately what, you know, what does a clinician want? They want a tool that works, right? Uh, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't change its characteristics vastly depending on, you know, if they're on the East Coast or the West Coast or using it, uh, you know, in, in slightly different patient populations. Um, all of which is to say, uh, it is really hard, uh, and, and gathering data um, on which to build tools uh, is probably one of the things that we think about the most. Um, 
but you know, if it were if it were easy, they wouldn't call it research, right? If you only had to do it one time, it would just be search. So uh, I think that's the idea. No, that's a great point. And you know, I think a, a lot of the validity of that work really requires you know, the skill set that comes from the clinical front line, as well as knowing the details of how the decisions are going to be made um, in order to incrementally take those steps, prove value, as you all have said, and then build off of that. You know, earlier as well, we had talked about how important it is for physicians to be part of the use case for what's being developed and to really refine that and keep it true to what's needed on the ground. Um, in emergency medicine, earlier in, in, in the day, we were talking about how we're often a microcosm of decisions, questions, and issues in medicine. And so I'm curious to know if through your work you found opportunities, and this is not to say that surgeons don't also have important things to offer medicine, but, uh, but emergency medicine is special. <laughs> and um, do you see ways beyond just physicians influencing um, what the use case is and where the targeted direction goes, that emergency medicine can make a specific contribution given our unique environment and skill sets? I'll give you a good example. Um, point of care ultrasound. Let's say, talk about ultrasound itself. And, you know, that you could say was a technology that was largely in the hands of a radiologist in the beginning, right? And we would, the, the actual value of ultrasound would never have been unlocked had it not got gotten to point of care. In fact, I think a lot of people would agree the fact that it got to point of care, which was actually driven by emergency medicine, um, allowed us to actually use that technology in many parts of the body, which radiologists would not even thought about, right? Whether it's, you know, a patient with acute vision loss and doing an ocular ultrasound or a patient with dyspnea that we're doing a lung ultrasound or the patient in shock that we're doing hemodynamic, hemodynamic assessments. That requires, you know, a, clin a clinician that is broad-based. Emergency medicine is a great one. So we obviously take care of every organ of the body and is more open-minded. And I think that's really important. I, my experience is, you know, different specialties think of things in different ways. And it, it, it's funny, not funny. It, it, for us to talk about precision diagnostics, we're probably talking about some innovation. We're talking about some disruption. It's about breaking convention, right? And so if... You know, maybe there's a day we never do blood culture, but if you're an ID doctor, you know, your life is blood cultures, right? But if we all agree taking care of patients and getting an outcome is really what we want, maybe blood cultures are yesterday's technology. I just throw that out an example. I know we have experts here that know more about it, but I bring this up because I think um, our colleagues in emergency medicine, uh, certainly, I actually like working with the residents the best. They think so out of the box, you know, when... I give them an ultrasound probe and they'll start scanning some part of the body no one has even written about. And guess what? They're finding really interesting things. And so that's exciting. I think I, I'm excited that our specialty can contribute. And, you know, this wouldn't have been the case, say, 20 years ago because we were just growing. But we're now in a place that we have a lot of academic minds, a lot of great clinicians and, and a lot of people that, have, you know, multiple other interests that, marry with a particular uh, clinical application that can solve a problem. I mean, no, that's... go ahead. I, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think that, um, you know, sometimes you have innovation by necessity, which I think is driven, happens in, in the ED, right? So, so we may not have all, you know, enough information to make the decision that someone else may make uh, later on. It, it's the site of greatest uncertainty in the, in, in the hospital. Uh, and what we have found in, in our group is when we start to work with industry, they'll have been working on a problem for a long time. Uh, and then they get into the emergency department and start working with people who are receiving people and, and have a fresh slate. And it's a whole different problem. So, so we're the ones that are bringing them in. We have the, you know, the first look at the patient. And we're setting the trajectory for up to 70% of all hospitalized patients right now, just because that's that's the way medicine has, has sort of changed. Um, so I think that emergency medicine is is the place for research, uh, for clinical research, where everything will be starting uh, moving forward. And we've we've found that you know every time we get involved with someone who's been not engaged with the emergency department, they're coming back to us wanting to do more and more projects because it is a place where. Uh, decision-making density is highest, uncertainty is highest. Um, it's a really great place to do this kind of work. That's not bad. 
Uh, and I'll just chime in with the obvious. Yeah. yeah, just I'll just chime in with the obvious, which is that most patients that end up in the hospital come through the ED. And so, you know, that's where you have the first opportunity to, to make the right decisions. And so I think at the beginning, at the top of the funnel, it's, it's especially important to get things right. Now, yeah. you know, yeah. If I could add one, I mean, you asked sort of what, what could EMED docs do, you know, there are, you know, examples right here on the screen, uh, folks that are willing to do clinical research. Um, but, you know, I, I understand it's, it's a very, very busy place. The last thing you want to be doing is sitting down and consenting patients. Um, but, you know, patients 12 hours later, 24 hours later, they're, they're a different patient, you know, and often we need work done in the emergency department. Um, I think it's a lot easier to get clinical research done in slower paced environments. Um, so the one thing I would say is, you know, the, if there was a key to unlocking more innovation, certainly at least one of the, those keys would be uh, in just improving sort of clinical research um, broadly across emergency medicine. There's great centers of excellence, um, but it, 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 that's, I think, the typical challenge in the, in the space. No, and I'm, I'm curious to know, um, in your explorations of this um, area, emergency medicine, and thinking about really even more broadly speaking, the acute phase of disease, which can happen anywhere, just happens to be what we spend our time addressing when people contact the health system. Where do you see the next barrier that we need to break in terms of achieving precision diagnosis, um, using tech or maximizing the use of tech? You know, earlier we talked about how we're um, figuring out how to use tools like machine learning and AI. We're figuring out that it's really important to identify the problem. And we're doing all that work, but what do you see as the, the limiting step that we really need to get past to make this a reality that touches patients' lives? Well, I think, you know, as we develop disruptive technologies, you know, by default, the adjective disruptive means that our colleagues are probably not going to be adopters or early adopters. Right. So I think that it's not just the tech, it's about the adoption of the tech. And it's a lot about market adoption. And there's a lot of things that influence market adoption, as you know. And there's lots of examples, whether, whether you talk about ultrasound or video airway or other techniques that we've now integrated. They take time. Um, so we as a specialty should be open to new care pathways, new technologies. If we really think that we are uh, an important part of the healthcare system where most all the patients are, that get admitted come through and we have a, potentially have a big impact. We as a specialty should be the first to say, yeah, let's take a look at this technology. Let's not stay in convention. Let's be open-minded and, and let's see what we can do. And I think when we do that, a lot of good things can happen. Uh, my experience is it takes a while just because we're physicians, right? As physicians, we, you know, we go through med school, you go through residency. Well, I didn't learn that in residency, right? All these technologies we talked about today, and none of us learned about that in residency. But so we need to be open-minded, and, and I hope, uh, as especially we are, meeting our colleagues, because I think ultimately patients will benefit. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the biggest things that prevents um, new diagnostics from being implemented outside of, of what you what you were just talking about is um, the, that not a lot of companies do these um, these studies that directly link diagnostics to outcomes and to in many cases financial outcomes for hospitals. Um, you know, obviously in therapeutic trials that's really important, right? You always have to link the drug to whether or not it actually helps mortality, right? And, and eventually you make a financial argument. I think in diagnostics, that's been pretty rare, where you see these multi-center trials that link diagnostics to improved outcomes. And I think when you go and you try to um, convince a new hospital to adopt it, the lack of that data can be very, can make it very difficult to get widespread adoption. So I think seeing more of those actual interventional trials with diagnostics, where you show that you actually make an impact on multiple centers, uh, could be something that would help to build confidence. I think part of it is also um providing support around a new bit of information right so a new diagnostic that the information may be great but it's challenging to incorporate that into our practice and to change the way we're treating patients based on that information if we don't know 
exactly what to do with it. And there can be papers published on it. There could be, you know, emails sent out to us, uh, uh, things presented at a faculty meeting about how to use this new diagnostic and how it could change things. But in real time, when you're overwhelmed with an information flow, if it's just another piece of information, it becomes very difficult to use. So we've seen that with some things that have come out and are populated in the EHR and they're just not used. Uh, that's because this is a new bit of information. So you already have a, a workflow and how, if you don't know how to integrate that new bit of information into your existing workflow and how to change, it can be really difficult to do that. So the implementation of this stuff, uh, you know, everybody on, on this panel has developed incredible technology, but the implementation is really, really important. And I think what, you know, you were saying earlier, Maya, maybe even hinting at is that I, I think there's some very important user centered design that needs to happen and how we push this stuff out to clinicians. It has to make an emergency physician's life easier. Uh, because anything that makes it slightly harder uh, is just going to get ignored um, unless the, the benefit is massive. Um, so I think that's one, one thing we have to really think about. Yeah, I think we should stop thinking about diagnostics and we should start thinking about diagnostics that are integrated into clinical decision support that is integrated into right. workflow. Like all of this needs to be a unified platform because just by itself, a, a diagnostic could be the most amazing thing in the world, but it doesn't make an impact unless people know how to use it properly and so, actually so you know, one of the things that moves the needle with doctors is evidence and i think you're hinting earlier that where we need those studies that actually look at the clinical outcomes that we care about and prove that there's actually impact not just that it's cool not that it competes with the processes that we use in an effective way but that it actually delivers outcomes that make patients do better and with that you know i feel like you get physicians ears open to being you know, ready for change. You know, then there's the whole work of like, well, how do we do the change? But at least now you can start. What's your experience with that degree of rigorous testing? We think of drugs and devices, they're required to have this level of testing to make it to the clinical environment. Whereas we don't quite have that system in place. I think it's evolving for machine learning, decision support and diagnostics. Uh, with laboratory testing, it's in play. Um, but what's your experience with how this all pulls together and whether that rigor exists and where you've seen it be successful? I think that system actually is in place. It's just, it's a little bit hidden, you know? So if you want to be a successful company and the, there was a question was asked uh, in the chat, if you want to be a successful company selling diagnostics, you have to figure out your reimbursement schema. Well, you know, you're not going to get reimbursed, um, at, at any kind of, you know, CMS or Mac level, if you don't have good outcomes data. Uh, I think where that tends to manifest itself is um, much earlier in the work stream, right? When you're sort of approaching uh, venture capitalists for funding uh, and they're looking at, well, first you got to build this thing, then you got to get it FDA cleared, then you got to prove that it works, then there's a funding decision that might come years later, then, you know, at some point you have a guideline adoption, and then and only then, uh, you know, sort of will, will sales take off. And that's, you know, whatever, it's the system we live in. I'm not complaining that it's uh, unfair or anything, but um, it requires a lot of fortitude. And I think it's one of the reasons that there has been um, perhaps less innovation than there could have been. Now, there's been some proposals uh, to increase transitional funding um, during the accumulation of that sort of evidence. And uh, to the extent that emergency physicians are, are you know, interested in supporting that, certainly advocacy uh, at the federal level for those kinds of transitional programs would be very useful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, there are definitely are systems in place and um, people, I mean, diagnostics do get adopted eventually, right? I mean, there are several successful diagnostics, so people do find a way. Um, I, I think a lot of this also comes back to what we were just talking about, which is that the, the past of diagnostics development has been you develop a test and you try to sell the test. Whereas I think the future is going to be an integrated platform where, I mean, the reason why diagnostic companies don't run these large trials is because they're scared that it's not, not going to work. And you run it and you spend, these are very expensive trials and, you know, they can take a long time. You invest all of this money and if it doesn't work, then you're, you're kind of dead in the water, right? And so the risk reward profile, I think, is not appropriate for diagnostic companies to spend a ton of money doing this. But I think in the future, if we really do have these integrated platforms where you're not selling a diagnostic, you're selling a whole platform that gives the right information, um, puts that in a pre presentable way to the physician, and then uh, kind of chases after them to make sure that, you know, they're making the decisions that you hope that they're making. Um, or, or that in, in conjunction with your products, they're making the right decisions. 
I think that's going to be the future. And then when that happens, then maybe the risk reward profile of running these trials will be more favorable and, and companies will want to do it more often. So we've touched on the idea of making better decisions, providing better quality data, um, the financial side where if you can't sell it, you're probably not going to be able to use it um, and maybe changing what you're trying to sell to maybe not being the test, but actually the platform that the test is sort of built off of. Um, but what about equity? And so this is, you know, often when we're testing how well we diagnose or screen or treat patients, we're looking at clusters of patients and saying, of all the patients who had a pneumonia, we captured them um, or we captured them in a timely fashion or we treated them effectively. But um, what seems to be emerging in our field is this idea about what about all the subgroups, these patients of different socioeconomic strata, different races, different neighborhoods in the area around the facility. How do we do this work so that we're not precise just for the whole and then the ones we missed, if they all happen to be in one group, well, it was just really good over the whole, so it's okay. Uh, are you doing work that's really looking at equity and where do you think we can probably advance work in this space? So, so we put a, a preprint online uh, about a month ago, uh, looking at that exact question. How does our, how does our algorithm perform over different um, you know, races, sexes, uh, various other demographic subgroups, ages? Um, and uh, in the paper, we sort of say, well, look, you know, it's better than standard of care. It's not perfect. Um, but I think one of the things it suggests is, um, you know, if you're, if you're using, you know, one biomarker, you know, your old, your typical x-ray, whatever it is for diagnosis uh, with no attention to uh, subgroups, then, this, you know, standard of care itself is not perfect, right? Everyone has seen the many, many papers that look at the subtleties that can come up and especially AI algorithms, things looking like, you know, uh, image interpretation, uh, EHR-based AI um, that can have substantial demographic subgroup differences. But what, what we showed and what others, I think, are showing, too, is if uh, you know, AI offers sort of a promise of better future, which is it's the one modality where if you want to be attentive to subgroup representation, you can be very effective and produce a product that is much, much more equitable and bias-free because it sort of allows you to tweak the inner workings of the product, right? Uh, and so I think uh, I think the future is bright uh, once the problem has been identified. And, and the reality is every, every manufacturer should care about this because it makes a product that works better, works, you know, more effectively across more subgroups. So I would say in the long run, the answer is we just have to be uh, attentive to making sure that we are systematically identifying the biases in our products uh, and, and working to exclude them. But I think it is very possible and should yield better products in the future. I think that's a great answer, uh, Tim. And I think a lot of it's, it, it depends, I think, on the product that you're talking about, like where is the bias coming from uh, and understanding that. So I would imagine that for, for you all at Inflamatics, it's about the data sets that you're using to train on, right? So who participated in that original research? Um, whereas, you know, we're looking at EHR data uh, and we can eliminate every you know, explicit variable that deals with race, ethnicity, things like that from, a, from an algorithm, but there are a lot of hidden variables. So I, I'll give an example. Um, it, we, have a, we have a tool that identifies, risk, risk stratifies people for, of, for risk of, of having a critical outcome at triage. Um, and then the tool is applied to the entire population. So we retrain the tool locally at every ED we go to. Uh, and, and the people that it performs best for are the local population, the people who look most like the people who are local. And the reason is because the, it uses past medical history. Uh, and so Past medical history is missing for the people who don't usually frequent that ED. So at Hopkins, ours, our model performs least well for white patients uh, because our local population is non-white. Uh, and so when uh, white patients are coming in uh, as transfers for uh, extended care or uh, specialized care, those people it performs uh, least well for. So it's kind of a surprising uh, result. But I think you know the more we explore how these biases are uh, created and then how we can correct for them. Um, I think we have the ability to do it. Whereas it's very hard uh, to do it as a human being, to correct them as, as human beings. We, we will work on it continually, uh, but I think we have the ability to uh, correct for them in algorithms or to, to work at it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything these guys said. Um, I think there's three pieces and, and they both kind of covered it, but I think the first piece is the training data. You need to make sure that you have good enough representation in the training data and you need to be conscious about that. And if you do have large gaps in the training data, whether it's due to uh, something like race or it's due to a biological signature, you need to be looking at all sorts of different representations there and make sure that you have enough representation when you when you build these algorithms. I think, I think the second piece, which we didn't talk about, is then also transparency when you give a result. So when you give a result, if you really didn't see many patients like that in your past training data set, you should be transparent to the user. And you should say, here's the result, but I'm actually not that confident here because I don't have that much representation here. So I think post-release, if you can give a level of confidence that relates to the sparsity or density of the training data that looks similar to that past patient, I think that's really important. Then the third piece, which, which these guys talked about, is kind of like the post-market surveillance, which is that you're never done. You know, you release a product and you go, you might get it FDA approved and everything, but you need to constantly monitor and see what populations you might be underserving and then go back and be willing to kind of refine the product once you, once you have that data. And so this is this is interesting because I think you know many folks. Uh, one of the buzzwords that's floating out there is this concept of algorithmic equity. That an algorithm is going to balance what as humans we might be biased to introduce. But the other side, and I think you brought this up, Jeremiah. Sometimes the the data itself is biased in a way that has nothing to do with what's happening socioeconomically out in our community. And if we're not aware of the, both da the data, is the, always biased. The data is always biased. <laughs> that's not by something. definition, it's always biased. <laughs> <laughs> the word something. <laughs> And th those biases aren't necessarily the same social biases or environmental or practice biases. So really, there are a couple of different aspects to bias that you all have highlighted um, that seem like they're really important. And I'm curious to know, like, what have you done to address those biases in your work? You, um, Tim, you talked about tweaking the model to be able to, to address what you see. But how have you actually done that? Uh, I mean, it's 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 present in the paper, but you can use a, a <laughs> you can use an approach basically to an, to try to either um, you know oversample underrepresented subgroups uh, or introduce in our case you know sort of variables markers that uh, are apparently less biased uh, on which to to do this. I mean, in in a field that not ours, in imaging, right? There's there's a lot of there was a big paper that made a lot of noise about. You could take uh, chest X-rays um, with no other labeling, and there's, there, you can make a very, very accurate determination of race. A physician can't, a machine can, and so if you're just sort of building AI on on chest X-rays, um, it can be very heavily biased. On the other hand, if you took that explicitly into account uh, and fed it back in and said, you know, sort of carefully, you can you can structure, for instance, neural networks to say, you know, don't pay attention to this or or, or correct for this. Um, then you could get a, uh, an algorithm on the, on the far side that's not uh, that, that doesn't have a representation of race that was present in the underlying bias data. So this is really um, insightful, and I think you know what many of us want to know is when you all are successful with the work that you're embarking in, both individually and with your teams, um, what's going to be different? Uh, what is your impact? your target for making the precision of the diagnostic work that you're work, you're targeting better 10, 15 years from now. I think Tim, you touched on it, but um, if you had to give a two or three liner on what that, what was gonna be different when you were done, what would that be? Are we gonna go around or what, what's- Yeah, we'll start, we'll, we'll start with you, Bobby. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so for us, I think it's about getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Um, and I think in acute care and in hospitals and in the ED, the challenge is that the uh, health signature of the patient changes dramatically. Uh, it can change dramatically over time versus like cancer or chronic diseases. So it's about constantly doing the profiling of the patient. Um, and a piece of that, which we haven't talked about too much, is making sure you're running the right diagnostics on the patient. So just running the same test on all patients may not make sense. Um, and so kind of intelligently knowing what you know about the patient right now and what information could really help you make a better decision. So you're choosing the right diagnostic test and then combining all that data together to make the, the right decision for the trait, uh, right uh, treatment decision for the patient. That's really what we wanna see in the future. Jeremiah? Uh, I think the goal of our group is to reduce uncertainty. Uh, and, and we're trying to do that via multiple pathways. Uh, the first pathway is by 
basically um, exposing all of the information that is already there. Uh, so one way that information can be exposed is through uh, AI algorithms that uh, that really create a risk profile for a patient based on things that are embedded in the EHR. And another way is just by uh, algorithmic processing of data and presenting it in a more simplified way uh, to a patient. And then I think the next way is, is uh, what was just uh, spoken of, suggesting what the next step is, right? So you have this idea, um, you know the patient is sick, you're not sure exactly why, we would suggest that you move forward with the, the next diagnostic and maybe it pushes someone to the technology uh, that Tim is developing or maybe it uh, pushes someone to a different technology. Uh, but I, I think it's about taking the human being who is there seeing the patient and reducing their uncertainty by maximizing uh, the utility of the information that's there already. Deco. You know, for us at BrainScope, I think it's about ensuring proper brain health. And you know, we all agree outcomes are really relevant and you have to have good CNS outcome. And so for us on the diagnostic side is making sure, you know, that our device can uh, accurately rule out an intracranial hemorrhage. So something really, really important. And, and do that in a titrated fashion, say without radiation. So that's really important on the front end. But then also many of these patients are injured and following these patients. So following these patients that may have concussion, ensuring that they get better, having an objective measure that they're on the road to recovery. Uh, and that's a game changer because we've never been able to do that. So that's really the focus of what we're doing at BrainScope. That's fantastic. And Tim? Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example um, of which I think we're, we're apart. So, you know, today a person comes in with suspected pneumonia, they're going to get probably some, some combination of CBC, CNP, lactate, maybe a procalcitonin, maybe a nasal swab, definitely a sputum culture, maybe a blood culture, chest x-ray. You're looking like, you know, seven or eight tests. And the New England Journal says, um, you run those tests, maybe about 45% of the time you get an accurate diagnosis of what's going on, you know, underneath. Is it bacterial, is it viral, is it non-infectious, whatever. Um, I think the idea of improved diagnostics should be somebody comes in with a syndrome, you know, a fever, and we can quickly say what kind. Okay, so you're dealing with something bacterial, right? And now you can sort of you know, choose the right diagnostics. Okay, now we're going to choose rapid, direct from sample, IV and AST. So that patient went from getting, you know, eight tests and the wrong treatment to two or three tests and the right treatment all in a very short amount of time. And people that are doing things that have nothing to do with us, things like, uh, you know, next gen sequencing for, for pathogen ID as a downstream mop up, um, you know, improvements in, in um, uh, things like direct from sample blood culture, when you know the patient is actually likely to have bacteremia, I mean, all of it will, will become this sort of spectrum that hopefully um, yields faster treatment, but also, uh, you know, at the, with the benefit of, of fewer tests and sort of a, you know, um, it should overall bring better outcomes and lower costs and frankly, less time in the emergency department, which is I think, all, all of our goal. We're heading into our final five minutes here of our discussion. Um, just wanted to go around for any final comments from each of you. This has been a great session. I think many of us have crossed paths multiple times and have been able to work with many people who are joining this conference today. Um, and so this has been, I think, at least from my perspective, great to hear a bit more about what you're doing, to have this conversation live, but wanted to just go around and offer you an opportunity just to add in some final comments as we finish out our session. And so I'm gonna go around on my screen. So Diku, if you wouldn't mind going first. So I would say this is an exciting time right now. And I would say that, you know, we have um, a, a lot of, really smart minds and especially within our resident fellow group and really think about how you can help on the technology side and helping medicine helping emergency medicine and and i know we have our classic fellowships and you all know them right but you know you know thinking about today you know would i do a, a fellowship in um ai and in informatics would that be a benefit or would I look at things like biodesign? There's other options out there. So for the certainly for the medical students, residents, think about options like this that can continue to contribute to, to the future of our field. Thank you, and Jeremiah. Yeah, I think, um, thank you for 
uh, inviting me to participate in this. And uh, it is indeed uh, an exciting topic, not just diagnosis, but I think decision making in general uh, in emergency medicine right now. Um, I think one of the exciting things about the future for me is to see where we land in terms of the interface between human beings, us, the emergency physicians, and all of this technology. Right? So I, I think that's actually the area where we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I think that's the, the place where a lot of people who are here can really get involved uh, in helping us push push the envelope on, on how we can create synergy between human decision making and uh, computer driven decision making to achieve an optimal outcome for patients. Fantastic. And Bobby. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I think it's amazing that we have um, panels like this. Um, I think it's it's about time. I mean, if you look at the world, everything is about data. Everything is personalized now from your Netflix choices to your Google searches. So it's kind of crazy the healthcare's lag behind that. But I think this is the, um, you know, we're in this uh, process of potentially a revolution, right? Where we treat patients based on their unique health signatures, not based on one size fits all protocols. And I think it, it's um, it's really, really important work that at some point it's going to affect probably all of us, or if not one of us, then one of our loved ones. So I think it's, it's uh, past time and we got to get to work. All right, and Tim. Um, I, I guess I would say, uh, I think innovation is really a, a team sport. You, you know, this absolutely. If you're if you're interested in engineering, you know, you, you can you can come work for us and help build new things. But even a new diagnostic, as you know, as was discussed earlier, needs to be integrated in the decision support system, and it has to be evaluated by clinical trialists, and it has to be. Um, if it's been evaluated well, you know, put into guidelines and then it has to be um, at a systems level, it, you know, um, reimbursed, brought through, um, uh, you know, other sort of systems of implementation. So I would just say, I don't think there's any, I don't, it doesn't matter what your interest is in emergency medicine, innovation will impact some part of it and we'd love your help. And for those on the call that don't frequently work with industry, please understand we, you know, we very much want to work with you. Uh, you'd be surprised at how, um, how many opportunities there are to collaborate across really that entire sort of product life cycle from um, concept all the way through to sort of late implementation. Uh, and so I think that's that's how we'll ultimately end up making a difference in patients' lives is, is by working together. No, and that's, uh, that was a fantastic concluding point. I think, thank you for all of your final comments. And this has been a really dynamic session. I think uh, I've learned a lot today. I want to thank all of our participants who've shared questions in the chat that we've presented to our speakers. And um, in the words, I think a couple folks here, you know, this is a team sport. Let's get to work. And so with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Lowe. Wow, that was an amazing discussion. I, I kind of feel like um, it was future looking and at the same time <clears throat> left a lot to still left me with a lot of questions and that's why i, I kind of typed in that uh, final question in the the chat which i wish we had time to answer like i would love, love to hear from you all what you think precision diagnostics in emergency medicine looks like in 50 years in 20 years or in 10 years even um i love having those discussions because it, it uh it, it gets everyone's imagination going. And I think still, even though this is science, right, uh, a lot of medicine and, and a lot of what we do still taps into our imaginations and, and imagining what's possible with uh, the tools that we have. So this was great. Um, this was our last panel discussion. So anybody here, um, obviously you're welcome to leave, but I would encourage you to go join us in the pitch competitions. Um, I've been dropping in uh, from time to time to listen in on the startups. And these are groups that are working with the current technology and trying to iterate on it and create those future 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty fun and exciting to me. If you're a fan of like Shark Tank or those kind of uh, uh, competitions, I think you would be especially interested in joining us for the last two pitches. You can go ahead and uh, exit with the little door on the bottom uh, left of your screen and then go ahead and click on the pitch competition uh, room and join them in there. Fun stuff. Hope to see you guys there. I know I will be there. And then we'll wrap it up after that with the awarding of the winner and uh, uh, just a wrap up. Goodbye. See you next year. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Appreciate you. Guys. Thanks, great. Everyone. Take care, gentlemen. Thank you. Bye-bye.